We're leaning for the finish line here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dave Goldberg, who's the communications director for the Smart Growth America Coalition, which is a national, state, and local uh, it, uh, a coalition of um, organizations to improve the ways that we plan and build towns, cities, metro areas. Um, it, it's interesting, he's actually a, a journalist um, and who's been uh, kind of um, infatuated with these topics of smart growth and what he's going to be talking about is how we can grow cooler. Dave Goldberg. Thanks for sticking around. I don't know what I did to, uh, to Ann and Laura to have them put me at the end of the day, not only at the end of the day, but after Andres Duani twice and, uh, <laughs> and after Ellen Dunham Jones, who's fabulous, my homegirl. Where'd you go, Ellen? Are you still there? She didn't even hear me. Give her, give her props. Um, and then after Shelley Patisha, who is the co-chair of the Transportation for America Coalition, which is uh, the, my other hat. In fact, my primary hat at the moment is to be the, the communications director for Transportation for America. And I'm, I'm obliged to, to go into a little bit more detail about the, uh, about the transportation issues that are confronting us this year. I mean, what I think I'll do is, because I think you've seen some of what I have in one form or another probably once or twice already today, um, I think I'll just kind of race through my slides and, um, and then see if we can have a little bit more conversation about uh, maybe how you all can get involved and what's really at stake here in the, in the uh, federal transportation bill that's up this year. Um, but seeing Andres Duane today reminded me of, uh, uh, he's, he's really an amazing guy. I, I had a, the privilege a couple of years ago after Hurricane Katrina to be with him on some charrettes that he did in Louisiana. And, you know, you, he stands up here and he talks about how he doesn't like to get his fingers dirty. And, you know, he, he comes off as this incredible elitist and he can sound, he can sound arrogant. But um, he's really, uh, he, what he really is is a very incredible sort of anthropologist, a synthesizer of, of human experience. He's kind of like a cross between, uh, you know, Pearl S. Buck and Seinfeld. You know, he, he's a minute observer of how people live in places. And then he can, you know, he can sum it up in these great little phrases. But I was, we were out one day in Vermilion Parish in Cajun country in, in, in Louisiana and uh, it, it, in dealing with rebuilding the towns of Erath and Delcom, which are just tiny points on the map, um, had sort of really had a difficult time sustaining themselves before, before Hurricane Rita in their case. Um, and it was, it was really hard to imagine what, what we were going to do. So we were touring around kind of, a, we had a, a guy giving us a tour named, uh, who was a, um, a police juror, and there, in, and there they had this sort of the equivalent, I guess, of a county commissioner in a lot of other places. Um, and he was touring us around, and, and, and he took us to the, the, the hot spot in Erath which, for, for lunch, which is a, a, a cinder block hut where you, where you, you know, the, the, the grease is, you know, this thick on the walls, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's good, the best burgers you ever had. It's really down home. Everybody in there is in a flannel shirt and, a, you know, a, a John Deere cap. And we sat down at this table, and, and he was telling us all about, uh, about the local culture. And this older gentleman walked in in a flannel shirt and a John Deere cap, and, he, and he, our host said, oh, he's one of my fellow police jurors. And Andreas said, well, why don't you introduce me? He said, oh, no, we don't speak. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we all think everybody else is corrupt, so we will all have our own investigation going on everybody else on the police jury. <laughs> so we don't speak. And so, so Andres, he sat by himself at the bar, this, this older gentleman. Andres said, well, I'm going to go speak to him. And Andres just went and sat next to him, and, and the guy looks at him sidelong. And I couldn't see exactly what he was saying, but it, 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 it looked like he was saying, how do I know you're not full of <laughs> And so Andres, instead of getting up and walking away, he pulls his chair a little bit closer and he leans into him. I don't know what he said to him, but I mean, in, in about five minutes, the man had his arm around Andres, was had it invited to his daughter's wedding. I mean, it was, it, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing that this, that this guy does. Um, anyway, I just was reminded of that story a little earlier and I, I, I couldn't help but tell it. Um, this basically, I, you know, I can condense my presentation here so that you can all go home or win your door prize. Um, as Tom Toll's cartoon sums it up so well, uh, this man's coming down the stairs. My house is too big to heat and it's too far from work that I drive to in a car that's too large, fueled by gas that's too expensive, and the money just goes to terrorists who want to attack the way I live. And I'm too tired for irony. Um, but the truth is, we, 
we have ourselves in something of a pickle, and Shelley alluded to this, uh, and I think it bears, it bears coming back to a little bit. Um, this, is a, this is a moment in time that we must recognize as being a pivotal time of change, and I don't mean it just in the, in the political rhetorical sense. We all recognize, this is a poll we did last year in anticipation of doing the, uh, putting together the Transportation for America campaign. Dependency on oil at that time, uh, even though the economy was starting to look bad, of course the economy is the top now, but dependency on oil ranked as the top issue. And, and fully 93% of Americans agree we, it's of urgent importance to reduce our dependence on oil. And by the way, not just foreign oil. People recognize that oil generally is at the heart of a lot of what we're dealing with. And this was also before uh, the run-up in gas prices, um, which is, you know, we've, we, we've seen the worst of it for, for now, but we're going to uh, almost certainly be returning to that situation probably a number of times before, uh, before we get the message completely. Um, and what this, this uh, the rise in gas prices added fuel to an existing trend, which is that we were seeing values plummeting in the places where people had to do the most driving in their daily lives, and where they were stuck on the road in long, in increasingly expensive commutes. And basically, this the the problem of oil consumption in this country comes down to, in large measure, the problem of transportation. Seventy percent now, this the figures changed a little bit, uh, is of oil here is consumed with transportation. Transportation, where transportation is concerned, oil dependence, energy independence, and climate are virtually the same thing. The more, the more we drive, the more oil we burn, the more carbon we're putting into the atmosphere and the more damage we're doing to the climate. Um, about a year and a half ago or so, I worked with some other people. My, my role was mainly to sort of translate into ordinary language uh, what, the, what the scientists were coming up with uh, in growing cooler. Uh, Reed Ewing was the lead researcher along with Steve Winkleman of the Center for Clean Air Policy. Uh, and the idea was looking at the way we build communities and seeing what, the role, what role that has in climate and what could be done if we built in a different way uh, to help the climate situation. And about a third of, of the emissions that the U.S. produces uh, for, in terms of uh, uh, climate damaging emissions comes from, from transportation. It's the fastest growing share. Industrial use is going down, transportation is going up, and it's the single largest contri contributor in the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, which is the United States. The carbon issue is really a, a matter of, where transportation is concerned of a three-legged stool. It's an overused metaphor maybe, but, but in this case it, it's accurate. Uh, it's the, the, the amount of uh, the vehicle efficiency, uh, how many miles per gallon you can get, the fuel carbon content, and, and then the third leg, which is not often talked about, which is how much we drive. You know, we talk a lot about, about technological solutions that we need to develop, when in fact we have the technology right now in terms of, uh, of more compact and walkable uh, places to live uh, to do a lot to help the situation. And Shelley uh, put up a similar graph earlier, but this basically shows you uh, the top line is the vehicle, vehicle miles of travel, the total amount of driving we all do. Uh, the second line is, is uh, the number of vehicles in the country, and, this, and the, the bottom line is the growth in population. And you can see that the growth in miles we, dri we dri have driven has been much faster than the growth in population. That growth rate has, has seemingly begun to level off, um, but, but the, the trend continues to be long range to be upwards. The U.S. also emits 45% of the world's transportation-related uh, carbon, uh, greenhouse gases. So we need to do something in this country if we're going to save the planet, but also if we're going to deal with, with our own energy issues, and it happens to be the same issue again. Um, so why do we drive so much in this country? And you, you all have been here all day, so if you didn't know when you walked in, you certainly know now uh, a lot of the reasons why. This is my, my home uh, territory of Atlanta, uh, but, it's, but it's, I saw something very similar when I was flying into Dallas this morning. Um, the uh, the cul-de-sac streets with one way out onto the arterial road, which leads to the freeway, which is the only way you can get anywhere if you live in those, in those areas. Um, so with this land use pattern, with this locked in transportation system we've got, we're going to see about 59% growth in, in, in vehicle miles of travel, even, uh, even under today's circumstances by 2030. And with that as a given, 
Uh, this, this graph is intended to show that projected growth in, in CO2 emissions is going to continue to outstrip uh, the, uh, the, the likely measures that we are going to put in place. This is assuming uh, that we are uh, using the most stringent this, uh, measures, in the, those of California, on a nationwide basis, along with the new, uh, the new CAFE levels, the new, the new uh, mileage requirements for cars. And you can see that, that the blue line, the CO2 line, continues to go up where it's supposed to go down to the light blue line at the bottom. And even with the most stringent uh, uh, measures that we, can, that we can imagine from a technological standpoint right now that's technologically possible, we still don't achieve the level that we're supposed to get to. We could do this. Um, this way we get our exercise and uh, move our cars around. But it doesn't seem to be in the cards. We're stuck sort of with this landscape for the moment. Uh, the low density, the big single segregated use zones, the lack of centeredness of our, of our metro areas. Um, Smart Growth America a few years ago did, uh, did another study, a compilation of data from all around the country and, and discovered that, e that the most sprawling metropolitan areas uh, have significantly more driving per person per day than the, than the more compact areas. But this is sort of like being the valedictorian of the, uh, uh, of the remedial class. Um, in, in the U.S., we're not the, uh, there's no, very few regions could, are world leaders. Um, and and to, to sum up quickly what, uh, what we found in Growing Cooler in terms of what could be achieved if we were to, if we were to uh, grow in a more compact, more energy efficient, uh, and ultimately a more sustainable way, if we could shift 60% of new growth to compact patterns, and this was, the, the assumption here was a, 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 still a relatively low overall density. You know, going up from a, a small handful of units per acre now to, to about 10 per acre on average. And that, that relatively still low, low density by comparison to many parts of the world still netted us uh, a tremendous savings in, in, uh, in carbon, um, equivalent to a, a significant uh, ratcheting up of the CAFE standards for vehicles. With a fuel cost savings um, over the next uh, 15 years or so, about $250 billion for American consumers. Um, and other, the other research that, that uh, we looked at also showed that uh, people who live in the most walkable neighborhoods, the places that are least dependent on, the car, on cars, are driving about a third less than those who are living in the more car dependent, the typical uh, environment. And this is, I really found this one to be interesting, is that on the weekends, uh, people are give, have a whole lot more of their lives to, them, to, to, to use as they wish on weekends because they're driving a lot less than people who are driving, uh, who live in more automobile dependence, who, who are doing all their errands by car um, on, a, you know, on a lovely Saturday afternoon. Uh, so basically what we found is that, the, that living in a walkable neighborhood, not even the most walkable, not even necessarily a TOD like uh, Shelley showed, which is a, you know, where you can where about half the, the driving occurs uh, in a place that's it's right up next to transit. But even if you live in a place that's not necessarily on a transit line, but is in a more compact form where you have, a, you have shops you could walk to, that kind of thing, a mix of housing and a and, uh, mix of commercial types, um, that's about, you, you would be saving as much gas as if you drove the most efficient hybrid and drove it efficiently. Um, and this is an interesting graph from Larry Frank at the University of British Columbia. Where he basically, this is looking at Seattle, the Seattle region. If you it was going to one of the newer suburban areas, that's more car dependent, and looking at some of the older areas that are more walkable. And basically, the, the more retail activity, uh, retail availability you have in a given district, the less your carbon footprint is. This is another way to, to look at the uh, compact form and mix of uses and walkability and how much, how much good it can do for us. Uh, and this, this, this chart looks at at the uh, at green building, and every, everybody I think understands that green building is important for saving energy, about 40% of, of, of energy overall, um, if, we're, if we're talking about all sources of energy, comes from the buildings that we inhabit. Um, and so it's really important to deal with the transportation and the building together, and this, this shows you that basically the, uh, that you can be the, build the greenest building you want in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in an automobile dependent place and you still can only get so, so low uh, and that the most energy efficient you can do is to build a green building in a, in a more accessible place. So from a policy standpoint, 
uh, I mentioned that we're at this pivotal point in history. What are we supposed to do about this? Um, and Transportation for America, Smart, Smart Growth America and uh, Reconnecting America last year got together to raise money to form Transportation for America. We've now recruited close to 300 partners at the national, state, and local level. Um, the AARP signed on uh, a week before last. The National Association of Realtors is, is a member. Uh, most of the big environmental groups, housing groups, uh, real estate developer groups, uh, grassroots organizations all across the country uh, are signing on. And we're finding an incredible appetite for the reform that we're talking about. Uh, but first, a little bit of, a little bit of history. Uh, Shelley alluded to this before. Um, there was a reason why we, we came out of World War II and, and did sprawl and automobile-oriented stuff and highways. Uh, this is kind of what it looked like during the Great Depression, and then we went through World War II, and we were, a lot, you know, we were admonished that if we rode alone, we were riding with Hitler. Um, and then with the end of World War II, we were promised that a new day was coming, and, uh, and GM told us that we should give a man some room to roam in, and told a romantic tale about driving up in your, in your Buick or other GM product, parking in the driveway, and having your son shoot you with an arrow. Um, uh, so the, the, when, the, when the war ended and when, when it was time to start thinking about what a similar pivotal moment is to what we have right now, what are we going to build for our future? We have, we've just come through this incredible economic time, this incredible uh, time of war, um, but we need, we, we need to look to the future. Well, they have, people actually look back a few years to the 1939 World's Fair and the General Motors um, Futurama exhibit, which envisioned... Um, uh, towers uh, connected, very clean, orderly places connected by fast-moving superhighways. And people stood in line for hours, millions of people saw this exhibit, to sit in their little chairs and go around the, the, uh, the miniature uh, version of this, uh, this Futurama. And President Eisenhower uh, came back from the war and said, we need to build this big, this big system of interstates. It was going to be 40,000 miles that we were to build in 20, in 20 years. In, a, in about 40 years, we had built 47,000 miles plus, and we're still, we're still going, mostly widening now, but some, some new sections. Um, and so then, now we've come to this point, where the last bill, uh, the, last, the last transportation bill, now in 2005, uh, was larded with bridges to nowhere connecting, um, you know, these this Alaskan landscape. Um, the uh, the uh, and then we saw the, the collapse of the bridge in Minnesota. Uh, it, so where we are now is bridges to nowhere and bridges that don't stand up. Um, and we also created a landscape that uh, that that is not entirely hospitable to ordinary human beings. Um, and, but now things are changing again. 52 years ago, uh, in 1956, the year the Interstate Highway Act was signed, was the last time we saw transit ridership as high as it is now. Um, and it really matters what we choose to invest our money in. Um, when I was flying in, I saw a project that th there were piers being put in what was clearly the floodplain of the river for what looked to be several miles from the airport. I don't know what freeway this was. It was quite wide, quite big. It was a grand, grand project. It looked many billions of dollars worth of, of construction. Um, and you, you look at that and you think, this is probably important and, uh, you know, to, to, to a lot of people, but we can make these kinds of investments at the blink of an eye, and yet we haven't been able to do other things in our culture uh, to make sure our kids are going to good schools, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it really does matter what we choose to, to invest in. Um, just I'll quickly breeze through some of this. You know, the, the, the happy coincidence here is that what we need to do for the climate, what we need to do for energy independence, is also what we need to do to meet market demand for a lot of the reasons that, that, uh, that, that Ellen and Shelley went through uh, earlier. This was a... Uh, just a survey we did with the realtors a couple of years ago, in which six in ten of prospective home buyers said they were actually looking for walkable places. Uh, Robert Charles Lesser did a survey of, of survey of surveys, market surveys, and found similar uh, conclusions. I think you, you've all seen the um, 
I'll go back real quickly, the, 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 these figures, but, but back when we were getting the suburbanization project started and the highway project started, about half of the households in the country had a uh, you know, conventional nuclear family, Ozzie and Harriet, mom, dad, and the kids. Um, actually, now the share of single-person households is slightly larger than the share of, of households with kids, uh, with two parents and kids. And we all know about the, uh, the aging thing. We don't want to talk about that anymore. I'm sick of that. Just, who wants to think about it even? Um, and similarly, uh, we've seen the, uh, this is the, you know, the foreclosure rates going in, in Metro DC going out from the center, essentially. Uh, this, uh, and this just basically shows you that, the, that we, we have all the large lot uh, single family houses we need to meet projected demand uh, in 2025, pretty much right now which is part of the reason why we're seeing the collapse in value in those places. And this is a recently released study that was done out of the, the uh, Smart Growth Division at EPA looking at uh, building permit trends and, uh, and finding that in the places that were actually had sound economies before the economic collapse and even some continuing after, the, the central cities were starting to get a larger share of the building permits and that they were, they were seeing, um, some, some cases for the first time in 30 or 40 years, uh, central cities were actually, in, or inner suburbs, actually edging out their um, suburban competitors, if you will, uh, in terms of issuing building permits. So something's clearly happening here. Um, and then you look at what people say uh, in terms of the, the public opinion about what should we do to serve, to so solve congestion in your area. And this was actually, you know, what, you're thinking about your area, your neighborhood, your region, what should be done. Um, only 21% think that road building is the way out. Most think that some combination of uh, improving public transportation and, and building places where we don't have to drive as much is the solution. And some, some regions are already grabbing a hold of this idea with two hands. Denver, uh, the citizens there voted themselves a tax increase a couple of years ago for the fast track uh, program, which is the basic idea is is we can't continue to sprawl up and down the front range forever. We're gonna to continue to grow, we're an appealing place, but we can do something to shape this growth. We can do something to give ourselves an alternative to being on, in, on a congested highway. And that's really what we're talking about. The way to solve congestion is to give us a way out of congestion. So, they, so there's a network of, of rails, uh, rail lines and rapid bus lines that are designed to accommodate a lot of the, a lot of the future growth. Charlotte is working on something similar. Um, many, many areas now, the state of California, the state of Illinois, and about 85 jurisdictions around the country have adopted what, what are called complete streets policies. How many of you are familiar with that term? Uh, um, about half. So I'll just quickly uh, explain it. It's, I think it's pretty obvious from the picture that the idea of complete streets is that they serve everybody. They serve the, the motorist, the bicyclist, the, the pedestrian, uh, the handicapped person, the person waiting for the bus, the shopkeeper who, uh, you know, who wants to attract people as they wander by. Um, and basically the idea is we, is our policy, says this jurisdiction, no longer to build sewers for cars. When we, when we redo a road, when we build a road, when we do significant up, up, updating of it, we will make it uh, a complete street. Instead of worrying about throughput of vehicles alone and not about what the, what's happening to the people on either side of it or who are trying to get across it, we're going to accommodate everybody. Uh, and this is incredibly encouraging to us that this is starting to happen and it's going, if, if we hope that this is uh, basically a, a, a feature of the of the next bill. As, as Shelley alluded to, a number of communities, and not just Portland, uh, are either, either have streetcars or are, are, um, are planning to, to put them in. And you know, these are the kinds of uh, projects that we hope the next bill will fund. Uh, taking these, these kind of hostile landscapes, uh, taking this, this land that's around these, these corridors that represents an incredible opportunity for development, filling them in, using these as multimodal corridors, making them complete streets, making them uh, pleasant and accessible, um, giving us lots of living options, lots of traveling options. Um, and then basically the, the single family neighborhoods on either side of these uh, can be completely left alone. Uh, 
So that's, that's the idea. We can talk a little bit about what's going on at the, uh, at the federal level, if you like, about stimulus, about prospects for the bill, about other things with climate legislation and transportation. But I know you've all been sitting, listening for a long time, so I will not belabor. I will uh, end here. And if you don't ask questions, I won't be offended. Because I want to drink, too. <laughs> Well, let me start with the, the question, I hope most of you heard it, but the, the question is, what can we do to start influencing the process around how the transportation money gets spent? Um, and the first thing that you can do is pay attention to what's going on with the stimulus money. The, 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 the stimulus package was a breakthrough in a lot of ways because for the first time in several decades, it broke this kind of 80-20 hammerlock that seemed to be in, in the minds of Congress over how money gets allocated. 80% highways and 20% everything else. Um, this is it's basically 60-40, uh, um, specifically transit, specifically uh, high speed and, and, uh, and higher speed conventional rail, and, and the rest in the highway pot. But the, the, the highway pot is, is the surface transportation program, which is, a, which is actually a flexible program, and Congress added additional f flexibility in the legislative language so that much of this money that's, that, that is being talked about by the DOTs as highway money is actually flexible money that could go to projects, local projects to make your streets better, to fix uh, intersections, to, to advance transit projects. There, there's, there's a lot that we could do with this money. So the first place I would get involved, if I were you, uh, is to take, pay attention to what the DOT is doing, pay attention to what your metro, uh, me the Metropolitan Planning Organization is doing, and see if you can raise, at least raise some questions uh, about how the money is being spent. You'll be told that, oh, it, you know, it's already been decided, but the first, the first half of the money has to be allocated within 120 days, but there's a year to allocate the other half. Some of that money has to be sub-allocated down to the metropolitan level. You have a, a metropolitan planning organization that by law is, is in charge of kind of deciding which projects get built in, in your region using federal money. Um, and so some of that goes, is going to the, to the MPO. That's probably the easiest place for you to engage is at the MPO level, but I would be paying attention to what the DOT is doing as well. And, and legislators may need to weigh in. Any other questions or observations? I mean, happy for you to tell me something. I, I, I would love to actually to hear something about what's going on around here and what, uh, you know, what you may want us to go back and tell, tell Congress they need to fix so that the same kind of thing doesn't happen again and again. Is the Trinity River toll road still going into Dallas, or are we going to put transit in Dallas? I don't know a whole lot about that project, um, but it, the, the description of it sounds really terrible to me. That, <laughs> and I don't know why at this, at this day and time, at this particular era, you would, you would do that. It sounded like you'd, you'd be cutting off your access to the river with a, with a, a freeway, um, and it just doesn't... It does, doesn't sound like a great idea. It sounds like a like kind of a 1975 kind of idea, not a not necessarily a 2020 kind of idea. I mean, if that if it was any of your idea, I, I apologize. <laughs> Don't apologize for a bad idea. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, you guys are like the triathletes of smart growth. It's amazing you spent the entire day here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, please join the CNU. When you, if you join, please check uh, the North Texas chapter. Uh, you can do that at www.cnu.org. Um, the local chapter is a resource uh, for either advice or for references or direction. Um, you know, please get a hold of us if you have any questions. The videos that were collected today will be posted on the website. They'll be posted with the speaker and then separately the slides so you can kind of see what's going on. You can refer that to folks that weren't able to make it today. Uh, today. There are other lectures that were posted from previous uh, sessions. Um, you can find those at, at again, uh, cnu ntx.org. Um, 
I'd like to thank our, our sponsors today. Uh, you know, in tough economic times, these folks really stepped up and contributed, you know, hard cash money uh, in these tough times. City Garland, uh, thanks to Doug Athos, um, City Midloth Midlothian, uh, DeSoto, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, we had uh, Drexel Realty, uh, Jones & Boyd, which uh, is actually a, an underappreciated engineering firm that really gets the new urbanism. Um, the uh, Greater Dallas Planning Council, El Centro College, and the North Texas APA. Um, I'd like to thank the, my fellow board members for putting this on. The, the amount of work that went into these two days is really a, just a tremendous amount of work. Um, our president, uh, Alicia Winkelbach, uh, Laura French, uh, Lindsay Cradell, uh, Dennis Wilson, Ann Daigle, they just did fabulous work along with the rest of the of the board and um, you know they, they needed to take a couple weeks off because they spent thousands of hours on this. Um, we'll be doing this from time to time. We do monthly um, uh, either kind of mini lectures or just get togethers to um, discuss progress in the Metroplex and uh, we'll be putting on another uh, seminar of this scale in the fall and we hope to see you. Thank you very much.